I need to know everything, who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche, five on a horse, I'm ready for war I'm coming for ghosts to turn to a ghost, I need to know everything Now you be surprised at the info you get is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in signs to let them in, talk up their body, another one body, that's just how it go I got some secrets, I'm shaking the game so they stay on their toes Stay in your lane, I to stay on the go I can to play with the pros and act like a rookie so they overlook me Then I double up or get none of their nose, none of them cold, they just got luck Hello, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a second. Let me stop sharing the screen here. Uh, welcome to Startup on the Blocks. And Bree, if you're back there, you can come on, on board here and we can get the show on the road. Good afternoon. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you for asking. How are you today? I'm doing good. I appreciate your coming on today uh, to kind of give us an update on uh, what's going on with the Small Business Development Center. And I, I think a lot of people um, may be interested in, in learning a little bit more about the services that you all offer. Yeah, so there's actually been a lot of developments um, going on. And uh, thank you so much uh, for having me on tonight. Uh, a couple of things that um, are in relations to the COVID-19 uh, disaster relief assistance. So as of March the 11th, uh, 20. Uh, 21. They uh, officially signed into law the American Rescue Plan. Okay. And, um, that particular plan has a lot of um, funding um, for different industries and for micro businesses, small businesses, uh, venues, museums um, that have been impacted by COVID-19. So um, today, as of today, the SVOG, um, which is the Shutter Venue Operators Grant, um, the portal became open today on the United States Small Business Administration. So if you are a museum or a, um, a music venue or affiliated with the arts, um, they have set up set aside about $16 million. Um, and that wow, okay. is available. It's, a, it's a quite a bit of money, but of course, it goes really fast. So the portal yes, is yes. today. Um, this particular one has a couple of things that they're going to look for you to do. Um, one, getting a DONS number and SAMS registration so that you're able to do business with the government. Okay. Uh, and then in that, um, when you're setting up those accounts, really, you just let them know that you're interested in the grant funds. Um, okay. They are going to be looking at, um, you know, basically just to see if you had a decrease in, in revenue. And obviously, most businesses in that industry, they've been closed now for months, some even up to a year. So the funding will um, be there to kind of help them out um, so that they can remain open in our community um, and provide those art services. Uh, some of the other programs out there that have been impacted by the uh, American Rescue being signed into law is the PPP fund. Okay. So, um, the PPP fund, as many of you might be aware, is the protection, um, paycheck protection program yes. now, that is set up for um, payroll expenses and business expenses. It was actually originally um, set up to deadline March 31st, and it's been extended now to May 31st. So a couple of extra months there. Okay. Um, if you haven't gotten that funding, um, and you are, you know, able to demonstrate a 25% reduction uh, in revenue sales, and it can be any quarter from 2020 or 21, 2021 um, over 2019 is what you'd be looking at. So you just need to have filed your 2019 business tax return, whether that's your Schedule C or your uh, Schedule K. Okay. And just demonstrate that you've had a reduction in gross revenue sales. Um, and like I said, that's a, a nice program to keep uh, your employees paid, keep yourself paid, and also take care of some business expenses that could be the overhead from um, your building or your mortgage or, you know, rental fees, things of that nature, or even uh, benefits that you pay out to um, your workers. 
Um, a couple of other programs that you might be interested to know about is the uh, restaurant revitalization. Um, that is also um, out there and available. Uh, if you have questions about these programs, um, the Small Business Development Center, I'm a business consultant there. Um, what we do is like we actually help um, educate business owners and entrepreneurs about those programs and uh, just assisting them through the application process because it does have quite a bit of questioning and paperwork that you'll have to kind of compile to uh, compile to get the funding. Um, but great programs, really happy that they're out there. It will keep a lot of the great restaurants and venues and restaurants that you like to support um, around longer. So that's the primary purposes of those. Um, the IDLE also, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, um, that has gotten more funding. So um, wow, okay. that's good. So it's a, a really great opportunity, um, you know, considering, you know, a commercial loan wouldn't be able to really touch any of these programs. Um, some of the um, programs are like 1% interest rates or 3.25% interest rate. And then some of them are a grant that you do not have to actually pay back. Mm -hmm. um, showing what you're using the funds for is, uh, you know, all it really takes and basically great programs out there. We, we do have, um, some information on our on our Facebook, um, and that's the SBDC at UWF on our Facebook page. Or, uh, as I said, you can reach out personally to me. I'm happy to help with those um, questions that you may have. Okay, good, good. Yeah, and yeah, you can um, a little later. You can put your email in the chat there so people can see how to get a hold to you. Yeah, and, yes. I, and I, I guess I connected with you on LinkedIn today. So you, you were out there on LinkedIn as as well and, and to, to get there. Yeah, before you go into your presentation about the services that the Small Business Development Center offers, I wanted to uh, kind of give a few updates on uh, what's going on with uh, Startup on the Blocks. And let me uh, sh uh, share my screen here a second and see. Okay. All righty. Um, and, and so so basically um, today we're going to, after you finish your update on the uh, on the uh, on the services that you all offer at at startup um, at the Small Business Development Center, uh, we I'll, I'll, these are a few things I wanted to kind of make some quick announcements on. We are um, uh, we're going to uh, we're scheduling our pitch competition um, for the 13th of May. We were hoping to have it this month, but uh, funding got delayed. So, but we do have the funding now, so we'll we'll schedule that for that, and we'll get the application up um, next week. So, be on the lookout for that. And this this past week, um, uh, this uh, this week actually, um, as far as all these opportunities that are out there, these um, there's just a proliferation of you know pitch competition programs for traditional businesses, startup businesses. And, and so uh, I, I'm, I've been posting those things on the Startup on the Blocks Facebook page and also been um, sending them out on our weekly uh, newsletter for Startup on the Block. So if you, you definitely need to pay pay attention to those because uh, I think there was one that there was a deadline is today that was coming up, but this is just a tremendous number of opportunities ranging from a few thousand dollars to um, uh, you know, uh, $250,000. So just pay attention to those opportunities um, that, 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 are, that are actually there. And uh, one of our attendees uh, 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 last month uh, turned me on to the Clubhouse iPhone app. And uh, uh, I think that's going to uh, provide an opportunity uh, for um, networking and, and um, and, and learning, and so what I what I also noticed on that clubhouse app, there's a lot of venture capitalists on there. That some of the, the uh, and so you can actually they also I've seen people doing pitching on there. So that's another opportunity, but it's currently it's only on the iPhone app and it's uh, by invitation only. But if if um, definitely is something to um, check out. Uh, next, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what we got lined up for you all the rest of the month. Of course, today we have um, uh, Bree, 
And um, next uh, week, we're going to have um, um, Jen, um, and she's got a product engineering, a product um, development type background, and she currently works at Google, Google, and she's also worked at Facebook. So she will, she's got she be able to share a lot of good um, information um, there. Uh, and then uh, uh, on the twenty second, uh, Blanca, she's uh, out of Atlanta, and she's um, involved in a, a lot of the startup programs up there. So she'll provide some good information, and, and she'll be a connection to the programs that are going on up there in in Atlanta. So that's a really good connection for us, and and um, and she should have a lot of good information um, to to share, and. Uh, and most of you all may know Kelly Research. She she's um, been involved in ecosystem here in Northwest Florida, and, and now she's working for um, Tech Forum. So um, the, she'll be the our guest on end of the month, and and hopefully early in May we'll be able to get a, a representative from Amazon um, to kind of share some of the stuff that they have going on as as well. That's so, a great lineup you have there. <laughs> yep, yep, and uh, we we definitely uh, are blessed to have a bunch of knowledgeable people, include, including yourself, um, Bree. But um, so you know, we should be able to provide you all some really great inf great information this month to kind of um, take your startup um, to the to the next level. So, Bree, I'll. <laughs> I have a quick question before you introduce me. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about how to get involved with the pitch contest coming up May 13th? Um, yeah. yeah, so um, we, we'll, there, we'll have an um, application um, uh, uh, out there uh, sometime next week, definitely by next Thursday. And it'll be a link and you can, uh, just like the last time, you can actually go uh, on the link and, and, and put in an application. And we'll, we'll keep it simple like we did last time. And we, we're going to have um, two categories. One for the we're going to have five finalists for the folks that are participating in our startup on the blocks um, cohort, and then we're going to have five finalists for the um, for the um, seven um, counties here in Northwest Florida to to kind of take advantage of that. So it should be should be a great opportunity to um, to um, to to move forward with your startup. Okay, perfect. So they'll just visit your website to apply and yes. that'll be available next Thursday. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll have it up by that by, information. Yes, by next next Thursday. Yep. So if you want to get your PowerPoint up and brief gonna tell you all about the service of the Small Business Development Center, and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna do some um, um, uh, um, some information on how you um, price your product and, products and services for your startup. All right, I am just simply uh, setting up everything here. So just yeah, stand. Okay, we're, we're, we're good. Yeah, there, there. Uh, I just want to re really emphasize, you know, the that there's just a tremendous amount of opportunities, um, and they're just like this month. There's probably been a, a couple dozen, you know, like pitch competitions, accelerator programs, you know, just all types of categories, you know, for women, for um, you know, just uh, all different categories. And so it's, it's um, pre pretty uh, neat and, and amazing. Yeah. Okay, I am, I'm ready to share. And Go I'm right ready. ahead. There we are. Are you able to see my screen? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So um, today, really what I wanted to uh, focus on is um, just to let our community and viewers know a little bit about the uh, Small Business Development Center here at the University of West Florida. Uh, if you're if you're unaware about the program, it's been around 40 plus years. Uh, it was part of uh, originally a pilot program um, and they had an office here at the uh, local uh, Navy base. Uh, and it was set up to um, bring a, a, um, a particular viewpoint to business owners and entrepreneurs in order to support them uh, in their endeavors and to create um, basically a, a, a return to the community. Now, um, we offer assistance to entrepreneurs and also small businesses uh, in every stage uh, of their business life cycle. So it could be in the ideal stage um, where you're just kind of thinking about what you'd like to offer or provide as a solution 
Uh, it could be, you know, you've already uh, been in business for a few years and you're just looking to expand, or you could be an established uh, uh, small or medium enterprise and uh, you might just be uh, in, in the stages of maturing or looking to exit and uh, maybe sell the business or uh, go on to a, another venture. And this presentation really is just a, uh, a brief little overview of some of the things that um, we focus on uh, at the office and um, what we would like to kind of offer support with. Okay, so um, our primary three client segments are pre-ventures, startup, and um, the small medium enterprises, those in phase one and phase two. Um, the network is actually uh, statewide, so it's actually um, nine regions here in the state of Florida. There's 40 uh, primary offices that we offer out of, and then we do have about 50 satellite offices. Those are different um, partners or that we've partner with either with like uh, local chambers or economic development centers uh, in the states. Uh, and basically, this is just a, a bit of an overview of those three primary client, client segments in our market that we offer services to. And then basically also breaking down some of the consulting services that we uh, strive to offer information as far as like expertise advice and educating those business owners so they can make the best decisions possible. Um, a small business is defined as an organization that has 500 or less employees. And typically you're not generating more than $10 million in sales. We do work with micro small businesses. So that would be included. Um, those are the businesses that may not have, uh, you know, single member LLCs or they may not have more than 20 employees. Um, we also work with anyone under 500 employees. Um, so ideally, um, Florida has about a, almost 99.8% uh, of businesses in our state are small businesses. Um, so there's about 3.3 million uh, employees and they're all employed in a small business setting. So it's typically not a cor corporation that you will see employing the majority um, uh, of the full time employees in our state. So and that's really our primary focus. We just want to be able to be able to support um, the small businesses, whether, uh, you know, they're in that growth stage or they're looking just to set up or if they're looking to exit that business and, and you know, create something new. Um, so a startup business or a small um, medium enterprise is described as being in business. Uh, so it's not considered a pre-venture and usually um, it just requires a couple of things. You either had a transaction of sale um, or you're offering a product or professional service uh, it could be that you've contracted uh, to offer a service with the government uh, in a business function, or you could have a debt or equity that you've invested in the business. Those are all things that demonstrate that you are in business uh, and that would really classify you as a startup or a small medium enterprise. So the... Um, the categories, again, are the pre-venture, so you're aspiring to become uh, a business owner and you're in the um, innovation or thought process or just an entrepreneur looking to see uh, what you want to offer. Um, the startup is you're your emerging, so that means you've already been in business for those few years. And then phase one is a growth. Uh, phase two is more so established. And I'm going to go into those definitions a little bit in, in further detail in the next couple of slides. Um, but really, it's it's just a um, a way for you to kind of better understand our organization and, and how we like to support um, the pre-venture startup and also those established small medium enterprises. So the, the pre-venture, they're aspiring. Uh, maybe you're experiencing, um, you know, a thought about a solution. And really, you're looking to see, is my thought, is my business concept 
feasible? Is there a market that will support it? Um, you don't have to have any employees or sales. Um, and, you know, you, you may have not already secured financing. So you're a brand new venture. We assist individuals in this particular uh, process so that they can go on and continue to offer that solution and get started up. Um, that might be just registering with the uh, division of corporations with SunBiz um, and making sure you're registered with all the entities in Florida um, and meet the requirements that the state regulate businesses to, um, to meet those standards. Now the uh, startup or emerging um, you may be a new business, but not necessarily a new type of business. Really, you've probably been around for those three years, um, and it's really not determined by the full-time employees that you have or um, revenues. It's really just having a lengthy establishment of time, and usually you're looking for anywhere from one to three years. So that would be in the startup or emerging phase. And then when you're in this particular stage, um, you might be developing a, a market, um, a marketing plan, or you might be strategizing on how to take over more market shares to kind of expand. Um, you know, if you're offering something in person, you know, that could look like exporting. Um, it could look like offering e-commerce. Uh, it could be offering services to the federal government. So anything in that aspect that would be considered in the startup or merging. And the final uh, segmentation would be the SME. So the, the small medium enterprise is a growth stage and it's actually broke, broke down into two parts. It's a phase one and a phase two. So phase one, I'm going to talk about that first. Um, you're a growing business. Um, so there's uh, actually room for you to grow. You haven't plateaued yet. Uh, usually these businesses have at least three years um, of operation, and they have um, at least five uh, full-time employees, and they're generating somewhere, um, you know, not quite more than a million dollars in annual revenue sales. Now, and basically, you're demonstrating that um, there's a need for you to grow. Maybe you've outgrown your space that you're in, and you're looking to maybe go to a new facility, um, or maybe you're looking to ramp up production, um, or are you looking to make a strategic partnership with the government? So those are some of the things that we would look into to see if it kind of aligns with your, your products and your segmentation and seeing how that market can expand for you. Now, phase two, uh, again, you are going to be an established business. So you have that three years already that you've had three successful years um, where you were successfully able to generate revenue and um, have equity into the business, you're still going to have about uh, at least four or five, uh, five times um, full time employees, excuse me. And then you want to be generating sales at a million or more uh, annual revenue sales. And really, you just need to demonstrate an ability to be able to, to continue generating revenue sales and increasing that. Um, you know, you might be looking at um, creating a vertical in another industry that kind of aligns with what you're doing. Uh, it could just be having the capacity or the desire to having a continuous growth plan. Um, and, and programs that we offer that align with this, we have the Next Level program. Uh, one of our consultants here in the office, Glenn, uh, he works with a hand-picked group of uh, 13 to 15 businesses that meet this criteria. And it is like a, a nine week program where they have uh, a monthly meeting that they meet up, but really the business owner sets the expectation of what their goals um, are and then work towards meeting those goals. So um, each one of these segments, we have different applications and different um, manners that we actually help value for those business owners and entrepreneurs. Now, um, something to note, uh, basically, we just wanted to deliver uh, a really a case-by-case -case, um, analysis of, of your business or of your concept that you're considering. So some of the segmentations or some of the service that services that I'm mentioning today, you know, maybe I didn't say something in particular. Um, that kind of resonated with you, but 
please do connect with us because uh, you might have a question or you might have uh, a need to speak with an expert. Um, all our business consultants are certified business consultants with various backgrounds. Um, so we like to kind of just connect with you and see case by case what it what exactly it is you're trying to achieve and then work with you uh, a plan of action or maybe even just, you know, connecting you with the right organization that will help you uh, grow your business in a manner that, you know, is uh, smart and also is savvy or maybe even pivoting. Uh, you know, as as we've seen, COVID-19 has brought up a lot of issues uh, where businesses have had to pivot and kind of refocus or reanalyze what they're bringing as a solution and how they're engaging their employees. So again, um, the market focus, just to kind of bring this home, um, we're working with uh, entrepreneurs and business owners that are looking to innovate, launch, grow, renew, or transition um, their business. And this is basically any of the cycles that a business might typically experience. Um, and you might ask why we do this. Um, part of the uh, Florida SBDC mandate is to help with the creation of jobs, retention of jobs, and revenue creation. Uh, so we really have an interest in making sure that um, the businesses in, in our neighborhoods, in our community are well supported uh, because uh, I enjoy those services and I, I want those businesses to be here uh, and in order for them to succeed, you know, they may need to connect with other individuals. Um, we do offer a prepaid service, so it's no cost to you to kind of uh, check out our programs. And then finally, um, if you are looking to start up that preventure or you are a startup business uh, and you want to become more efficient in your delivery system or training, um, Check out our online resources. Uh, we do uh, a number of things that kind of align with workshops and research uh, and other appropriate service providers, just kind of making sure that uh, we're part of the ecosystem that helps drive uh, new businesses and businesses to stay and thrive in our community. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here now. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take those questions. Yes, and uh, Poppin has a uh, a question and answer tab. Now I just noticed it, so uh, feel free to type your questions in the uh, question and answer tab. And and I uh, we got some folks looking on Facebook as well. So please type your questions in the comments so we can uh, get, get get them answered. Yeah, Bree, I, I think um, uh, what I've um, notices there's always been a lot of confusion about uh, the products and services that the Small Business Development Center offers. And, that, and we really appreciate you going down the list to, to make everybody aware of all the different um, services that you all offer. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me uh, tonight. I'm always happy to talk about um, things that are really applicable to the people in the community pushing those businesses forward and making sure they have the support that they need. Um, yes. And I, I was just thinking, I saw uh, Terry Williams uh, was watching on Facebook over at, with the Minority Chamber uh, over in Panama City. So you all offer services over there as well, right? Yes, we do. So um, the neat thing about the University of West Florida, um, they're our host partner and they allow for us to service the 10 communities uh, or uh, counties that are from Escambia County over to the Tallahassee area. Wow. So, you know, whether you're in Bay County, Jackson, Washington, uh, Gulf, um, Walton, or Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, Walton, um, we cover all 10 of those counties and our primary offices. So if you're ever wanting to just kind of uh, know where we're located, we have an office location at the University of West Florida here off of uh, University Parkway. Um, we do have an office in the Fort Walton Beach area off of Bill Parkway. And then uh, we also have uh, an office at Tech Farms uh, in the Bay County area in Panama City. Um, but we do offer, um, we try to make it where, you know, wherever you're at, we'll meet you. 
Uh, so we do have some satellite offices in like Navarre, uh, Fort Walton Beach, also in the Crestview area. Uh, and we just recently set up some areas uh, in Mariana and also Chipola College. So we do have some outreach offices there um, that we man at least once a week. Um, but primarily, um, you know, I, I did throw my email in the chat. So if you ever need just to kind of a quick response and answer to some questions, I actually offer a, um, a weekly office hours on Wednesdays from nine to noon. Um, I usually just carve out some time and make myself available. So if you're just looking to connect, that's a great time to do it between nine and noon uh, each Wednesday morning. That's fantastic. And you, you mentioned Tallahassee, but you all don't have, you all don't service Tallahassee, do you? We don't. Our, um, so that actually transitions over to FAMU. Okay. Um, they're the region that borders us. Um, and basically we don't really cover Tallahassee, just the 10 counties up into that area. Okay, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. yeah we, we have Angela um, uh, from Tallahassee on, on the, on Facebook as well. So I just, Thought I'd make that clear. All righty. Well, yeah. well, thanks to me and Bree. Um, that was some really great information, and and, and uh, so we hope our audience can uh, take advantage of that. And and so they should follow the Facebook U.S. Facebook page and to kind of get the information. And it's a lot of good information. Yes. So um, online, you can find us at the uh, SBDC. Uh, .uwf.edu. And then if you follow or like our Facebook page, um, you would really want to be following. Um, it's basically facebook.com forward slash SBDC at UWF because uh, all the grant opportunities, um, federal funding dollars, things that we're aware of, we push to our Facebook uh, and if you go to our actual website, you can join our newsletter and we send out uh, monthly email ass. Uh, we don't send them out too often, just by, by monthly. And that's just kind of a list of some of the things that are hot topics that you might be interested in. All righty. OK, thanks a lot. We sure appreciate you coming on this week. We'll, we'll see you next week. OK, thank you so much for having me. All right. Fantastic. All righty. Uh, so uh, next we're gonna uh, go into uh, a, a short video on um, startup pricing, but I, but I think uh, uh, get your questions ready because one of the challenges in, in, in when you uh, develop a new product or service is how to price it. And so it's, 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 a, it's definitely tricky. So uh, I'm excited that uh, Y Combinator has a, a, um, some really good information on, on, on how, to, how to do that. Yeah, I definitely remember, you know, um, you know, trying to come up with pricing pricing from for our, our products and services for uh, cognitive, and it, it really was a challenge to to do that. So I think this information um, would be um, definitely helpful. So just take a look. I'm gonna share my screen here. Make sure we conclude this some audio in there. Let's see, we'll get it rolling. Hold on here, I stopped it here. I don't hear anything, so let's see what's going on. Turn my volume up here a little bit. Okay, and I see the thing is muted, so I'll unmute it. Okay, we should be good. Both at YC itself, it's a very, very popular workshop that we run. And so we're going to go over a lot of basic fundamentals for pricing that hopefully will just help you understand how to approach your pricing and monetization from first principles. And then you help you help yourselves. Same thing with the landing page talk. So we're going to go over first principles for pricing. We're going to go over why is pricing particularly hard for startups? for people making innovative products in new markets? Like, why is it extra difficult? Um, how do you do price optimization? Like, how do you actually do it? What does that actually look like? And just kind of demystify that whole process. When we look at the challenges of pricing, you start recognizing why certain types of customer segments that you're going after are difficult, like SMB. And we'll talk a little bit about that. 
We're going to talk about how pricing affects your acquisition strategy. It changes what you can do and what you cannot do. And it's extremely important because a lot of companies get caught up doing the wrong acquisition strategy or wasting too much money because their price is incorrect. And then uh, I'm going to give you some rules of thumbs, some pricing tricks, just to help make it a lot easier uh, when you're encountering different pricing problems. I call them pricing trick sprinkles. Okay. There are three levers you can pull to improve growth. So in the last talk, I talked about conversion rate and churn. But monetization is actually the big dog. It's the one that I really like. Now, there was a survey done with over 500 SaaS companies. And they talked about sort of like amount of effort that they put into each one of these strategies and the returns that they got as a result of it. Now, acquisition is really fun and exciting. It's the one that everyone kind of understands simply. It's like I get more customers, I get more logos, gives me more growth. Retention, of course, is about keeping customers. And monetization is about getting more money per customer. Now, if you increase just your efforts or resources by 1%, your work on acquisition, you usually get a return of about 3.32%. In retention, it's about 6.7. And when you're optimizing pricing, that gives you your biggest bang for your buck in terms of impact on your business. Yet it's the one that is most neglected. And I think it's the one that everyone is so afraid to touch because they're so scared that if they get the pricing wrong, that they will lose all their customers. Now, the first principles, the basic idea about pricing, the thing, the concept that really opened up in my head, how to think about pricing, how to understand the problems that people are facing and why startups get it wrong is to use a concept called the pricing thermometer. And so you have to understand that when you price something, there's actually like two other factors at play. And so there's the cost, there's the price, and then there's the value. And the interplay of and relationship between these items affects how growth happens inside of your company. Now, the gap between price and cost, that is your margin. That is your incentive to sell. And so the bigger that gap is, the more you are driven to want to push your product to your customers, to have your salespeople, etc. This gap here between price and value is incentive to buy. And the larger that gap is, the easier it is to have your customers want to sign up or use your product. Now, to figure out price, there's really two ways to go about it. You either start with the cost, if you know what it is, and you figure out where your price is based off of that. That is called cost plus. The other way to do it is figure out what is the value of your company or product or service, and then you figure out your price from that. And that is called value-based pricing. In startups, and almost pretty consistently across all businesses, everyone will tell you, you should strive for value-based pricing. It allows you to charge a whole lot more. It allows you to manipulate this incentive to buy. The problem is, because people do not understand their relationships, or even understand what are their costs, and what are the value that their customer is going to think about their product, they put their price in a kind of arbitrary place, and they don't know what are the forces at play that drives it. And it results in four different types of mistakes. The first one is startups will price their products too low. Basically, you consistently undercharge. It is the number one piece of advice we give to most startups to fix their pricing. And I'll talk a little bit about why most companies fall into that trap. You underestimate your costs. And the result is um, you have a problem where your margins aren't enough to cover sort of acquisition. You don't understand your value. You don't understand how your company thinks about the problem that you're solving for them or how they value it. And either they don't understand your value or you don't know how to convince them of the value that you think you offer. And as a result, you can't get the price that you want. And lastly, you focus on the wrong customers. That you think, man, 
man, if I built a better product and I charge half the competition, I win. Thing is, that almost never happens. And the reason is because you as a startup, you as working on something to create a new market are working on innovative products, you are focused on the wrong customers. They are not the mainstream people who are going to look at the price and make most of the determination based off of that. So this is the sales and profit over a product's life from inception to demise. That's what it's called. Um, all you need to know is that these are five different stages of a company. And this is what sales might look like over different stages and what profits might look like over those different stages. You who are in startup school, you who are getting seed funding, you are in the first two stages. Product development stage, introduction. You are not in the growth phase. And the thing to keep in mind is that the customers in the first two stages, the ones that you're going after, they don't look like mainstream customers that you find in growth and maturity stages. They're not mature customers. They're early adopters. And the thing to know about early adopters is you kind of don't really get a lot of momentum and growth until you get past the first 2 to 5% of potential buyers of your market. These people in that 2 to 5%, they're called early adopters. And the thing that drives them is very different from mainstream people. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind about pricing innovative products. What you are trying to do fundamentally is require users to change their pattern. Stop doing it the old, shitty spreadsheet way and do it in the new, better, your way. And getting someone to change their pattern is actually really difficult, right? Especially if they're a mature person. Partly because the average user lacks information needed and the trust in you or whatever it is that you're making to make that change, to take that risk. You are entrepreneurs. You're comfortable taking risks. Your customers are not entrepreneurs for the most part. They're probably less comfortable taking risks. And so in the beginning, you're going after people who are willing to take a risk. And those are early adopters. Those are people who care about benefits above all else. That the highest value to them is beating their competition, doing something much better, and taking a chance that something new will give them that edge over anybody else. Those early adopters, therefore, are not price sensitive. If anything, if you've built a better product and you charge less, it looks like you have reputation risk. It's like, why is it too good to be true? What is the catch? And what will end up happening is it makes, takes it much longer to get them to understand. This is basically all price optimization. This is the most complicated way that you can try to show price optimization. This is a demand yield curve. And what you have on this side is different prices. And on this side, you have sales, unit sales. And basically what you are trying to figure out when you're optimizing the price that you're charging your customers is like, basically, what is the perfect balance between how much I charge and how much sales volume I get? And then your price optimization is basically that. Try different prices and then see what the effect is. When I have my companies optimize their prices, they just use a very simple table. You don't need to try to f figure that weird ass graph. Basically, you want to have a column that says, these are the prices I'm going to try. And then what is the result in conversion rate? What is the result in sales volume? And then how much revenue did I generate? That's all it is. And so let's say I have prices at these different price points and I get these different conversion rates and I get this sales volume, I should immediately be able to see who the winner is. Here we go. Now, the one thing to keep in mind once we've figured out something like this, simple product, is that these areas at lower prices, if you can afford them in terms of your margin, are actually lost opportunities. And what you want to understand about these are these are what you're going to see if you offer discount pricing or offer tiered pricing at different price points. 
Another exercise I like to go with companies when dealing with pricing is help them understand is like, are you in a danger zone? And so what I usually do with my companies is I help have them sort of calculate what would their business look like or what is it going to look like to be a billion dollar company. And usually the rule of thumb there is to be doing a hundred million dollars a year in sales and revenue. And so that basically is like at your price that you give, how many customers do you need to have to make a hundred million dollars in that year? So let's have a bunch of different price points. Then we know, okay, great. I need these number of customers in order to make this formula work. You understand what that looks like. At a hundred dollar price point with a potential of a million users, right? This is consumers. That's what that consumer space looks like. And you know what this down here looks like. Hundred thousand dollar a year. We call this enterprise. This area here is the part that a lot of companies are in and really, really struggle. They're on the struggle bus and it tends to be SMB. These are people who kind of treat their money like consumers, right? But they kind of look like they might be an enterprise. And the reason why this is such a danger zone is because it will tend to fit in the wrong place on my next diagram. So let's imagine that this vertical axis represents price. You can charge either a high price or a low price for your product. And this represents complexity of your sales process, low complexity to high complexity. If you are having a product that is $2,000 or less and is basically self-serve, then you have something in this quadrant here. And this affects completely what you can do in terms of what drives your business, what you can spend on to get that sort of growth, that price point here at $2,000. It needs to be have almost all marketing be inbound. You can't spend a lot of money outbound or in ads, et cetera. Your support has to be completely self-serve or very, very minimal. You have no sales team at this price point. You can't afford it, right? But conversions can happen on the same day. Must be in a self-serve model. Transactional. So between two and $10,000, when you're able to charge this, you're able to have a few new toys at your sleeves. And so marketing now can be focused on generating qualified leads. Your customer support can now offer like SLAs, or you can start paying for training to help people get onboarded. And for sales, you can't hire a dedicated salesperson, but maybe you can have an inside sales rep to sell within companies or within your customers. You could maybe have an SDR and you can maybe have someone dedicated to giving product demos. Sales cycle here should not be longer than one to three months. Enterprise, so over $25,000. Now for marketing, you can start spending things on branding, on building up trust with customers. Your support is very, very high touch that you can afford. You can do phone support. You can have a customer success person dedicated to the client. And for sales, you're going to start thinking about sales managers, dividing stuff into territories and having sales engineers that participate in terms of the conversion and the sales calls. These will have a sales cycle of about six to 12 months. This is the garbage zone, right? <laughs> And you know, if you're potentially in this, and this is the big wake up call for you, if it's taking you months and months and months to close someone, but you're not making a lot of money to cover it, you have a process where your acquisition costs are just too high for you be, to be sustainable. And you have to get yourself out of that problem. All of your work should be towards increasing the perceived value of your product or service. I'm going to end on a good rule of thumb. So if you are starting with some kind of price, but you don't know how to sort of optimize it or figure it out, then here's a good place to get going. The first thing is I like to have things where the value is 10 X the price of whatever it is I'm charging. And I want to have it so that the value is easily understood to be 10 X. So for example, if I charge for a product that is $10, then it should be in terms of perceived value by my customer that it's worth $100 to them. 
if they do not immediately understand the 10x value of the price, it's going to be hard to get them to move. Their incentive to buy might be too low. Once you have any kind of price, and this is particularly important for people who are doing B2B or enterprise sale, you should start practicing raising prices. And I like to just start by raising prices by 5%. If you feel really confident, jump it up by bigger numbers if you want. But this is a pretty safe way to do it so that you can feel comfortable with it. And you want to keep raising prices until you're losing 20% of your customers. That's about a good balance to have in terms of understanding that like I have a good price here. I'm losing 20% of my deals. It's not too high. It's not too low. In summary, for pricing, pricing gives the most bang for your buck. You should work on pricing. If you've never touched the pricing of your product, then you're losing out on lots of potential growth. Understand the variables. Do you really understand your cost? Do you understand why you've played the price where it is? And do you understand the value? When you go into a sales meeting or a call, do you talk to people and you basically say, it's like, I know exactly what this is going to be worth it to you. So when I tell you what the price is going to be, you're going to be like, damn, that's totally worth it. Go after early adopters. Remember, as a startup, that is who you're going after. So when you are talking to customers and they are taking a really long time to make a decision or they're wanting to have a lot more proof that other people are using it, you are not talking to an early adopter. You're wasting a lot of time on non-believers. Go after them first. Don't take it personally when these people who are much more mature aren't ready for your product. They were never going to be. Your job is to get through that first 2 to 5% of the market. Those early adopters care more about benefits than price. So don't undercharge your products when you have something that is of value and easily understood to have value. Get organized. When you're doing price optimization, it's really, really easy. Don't overcomplicate things. Figure out a bunch of different price points you want to check. Understand sales volume, conversion rate, and the revenue that's involved, and that will help you make the best pricing decision. Your price will determine your acquisition strategy. If you realize that your sales cycle or all the things that you're spending on is way too much for the amount of money that you're charging, you either need to increase the price or completely reduce your acquisition strategy costs. Use the 10-5-20 rule. Set a price that is 10x, that is a tenth of the value. Increase prices by 5% until you are losing 20% of the deals. Thank you very much, guys. That was a lot of information packed in that uh, 19 minutes. So, uh, yeah, so definitely go back and look at that uh, that uh, video again. It's just was a lot of lot of inf information. And so, are there any questions out there? Let's uh, see. I didn't notice um, any on 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 face Facebook either. But um, so if if, if anybody's um, out there that's um, struggling with trying to determine some pricing or are you are you sure you got a good good <laughs> good price yeah it's just a challenging thing to do so but i i um i think that uh y combinator with these uh, videos that they share and if you, uh, you sh if you haven't you should um all have been enrolled in the startup school.org and that's where you would see these um, videos at um, to get out a great, great, inf great information. That's startupschool.org. Um, we definitely, um, you definitely don't want to be leaving money on the on the, on the table. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, a neat and and so I, I remember, you know, on my startup journey, uh, I, um, it's. A lot of times, depend if you're doing something that's similar to what other companies are doing, you you can um, you can kind of scope and see what their prices are. But I but I, I still say uh, what you just heard is the best approach, you know, for for moving forward with your um, 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 startup um, pricing, and, and and we definitely appreciate um, uh, you all 
paying, paying attention to that. But like I said, um, what we do here at Startup on the Blocks, we, we, we're we interested in the best practices. And, and so we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. And, and that's why I like Startup School and I leverage a lot of, a lot of their videos and their content because they, they pack the most information in the shortest uh, amount of, uh, of time there. Um, I guess, um, Lloyd Jr., if you want to come on, I um, I did have a, a, a question or two for, for you. Um, but just want to remind everybody, we got a, a, a pitch competition uh, coming up on um, May 13th, and we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll um, have that application out there sometime next week. And, and, and Lloyd Jr., the reason why I want you to come on, because you, you were just in a uh, performance last week, and and so when you did your um, your um, uh, presentation on uh, preparation for like pitching, uh, could you kind of briefly kind of t uh, run us through what you had to do to prepare for that uh, performance, uh, which which is a kind of analogous to you know getting ready for a pitch. Um, yes. So for many of you who don't know, I am an opera singer by trade, and I was just recently at Opera Orlando performing in uh, Carmen. And it was a special production that was taking place in 1960s Haiti. So we were speaking Haitian Creole in the dialogue and singing in French. And so when I got the call maybe a month before, or not even a month before rehearsals, maybe a couple weeks before rehearsals, um, I had to immediately start working on memorization of the text and making sure I knew the story, then working on memorization of the music and making sure I, I knew that. Then from there, then that's when I had to also then begin to know what my character, who I played Zuniga, um, what his role was in the plot line. And, um, and it's stepwise motion. So you go in and day one uh, of rehearsal, was singing and reading through the entirety of the opera. Day two was starting to stage the opera. So that's when all the other people are there singing their parts and um, and doing their, um, and acting as well. So you have to have some kind of basis for it before the staging director can actually um, manipulate and say, oh no, I'd actually like you to do it this way, or I'd actually like you to move in this manner. Um, but. Then we rehearsed through that about two weeks. And then the last week was uh, a tech when we now with the orchestra with another 60 people who we have to now sing all of that stuff. And the conductor is now a football field away. And we have to be able to act, be in costume and be able to do that um, and to be able to perform uh, with these group of people all at the same time. So it's a layered process. And kind of like what I was hearing from Kevin's talk is that you have to start, you know, uh, with the, the understanding of where you are and recognizing what you need to have done before you can move to the next level of singing with the group and knowing where your place is, then putting on the costume and staging and stuff like that to tweak that. So, so what I what I see when I look at you know preparing for a, a pitch, so like um, you're you all doing Carmen, but in, in a in a pitch situation, you're doing your your company a product or service. That's the story you're you're telling, and you're telling your story, and so you're you're definitely most f f familiar um, with that. And so and and, and so it, so you probably felt a little bit more comfortable because you had did Carmen uh, understand before? My fourth production of Carmen and I've done several different roles in Carmen sir so you know each time is something new so I knew the story well but then like you were saying in character development who is Zuniga now instead of Spain now we're in 1960 Port-au-Prince Haiti who is that Zuniga and so you still have to build that and, and create that. Yeah, so if I'm relating that to um, my pitch, uh, I have an origin story, and and I have to, you know, I know that origin story, but I just have to tell it in a way to, you know, grab the audience, and and then and and so so the deal is is you have to um, uh, so you mentioned memorization, you have to memorize it, and and the people I've seen most successful with their pitches. 
they 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 get it down to a science they can do it in three minutes and and they don't um they don't stray from their their, their script because they know their story they know their product and and they know who they're the audience they're trying to sell it to and so it's that preparation and and so your 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 company is your baby and so you um you you uh, should know it better than anybody you know um what why you chose this company to solve this problem you know it better than anybody so it sounds like you just got to rehearse 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 and get your get your story right and then rehearse and rehearse and rehearse yes all right I just shared the information of if people would like to actually see the production that I was in, um, definitely go. It was a majority black cast and the Haitian community came out in droves to support the work. But if you have any questions about any kind of memorization or how to build a story for your company, your startup, your idea, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll sit that, send that in the text as well. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you next week. And we're looking forward to our, our guest who's a, uh, uh, she works for Google and she's an expert on uh, product development and product, product engineering. And, and so um, she also knows about payments. So get ready for a good, good um, presentation next week. Thanks a lot.